Good morning. I'm Marilyn Thompson with APA, the Engineered Wood Association. Welcome to the second in our series of Engineered Wood Products training webinars. Today's topic is Engineered Wood Products Design Considerations, Selection, and Specification. Our presenter today is Nick Wartell, an APA Engineered Wood Specialist based in Atlanta. Nick is a graduate of the University of Central Florida with a degree in Design Engineering Technology. He has over 20 years of experience in the building products industry, including truss design, engineered wood product sales, and support, and management. He joined APA and covers the Atlanta Territory, which includes Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Central and Western Tennessee. Once again, welcome to today's APA webinar. Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marilyn. Let's get started. Let me remind you that the individual manufacturer recommendations may differ. You should consult appropriate manufacturer's literature when specifying any engineered wood products. Today, our training objectives will be able to find the types of loads of building components. We'll be designing for load paths, looking at deflection and calculated spans of eye joists. We'll be seeing the differences between simple and multiple spans, and finally specifying engineered wood products. In compression, wood is utilized vertically as studs, columns, and posts. Wood is also used in compression and truss assemblies, such as at top cord and some web members. Compression applied perpendicular to the grain is weaker than if applied parallel, since it crushes more readily. In tension, wood performs well with the load applied parallel to the grain, as long as the grain is straight and there are minimum knots and other strength-reducing characteristics. This is the most demanding application for wood performance. And these applications in general require a higher quality than compression members. Note that tension failures tend to be abrupt, failing dramatically with little or no warning. Compression failures tend to be noisier and more gradual. A beam distributes loads across a horizontal span and transfers it into the supports. The beam resists this loading typically from gravity forces by bending. A bending moment is a measure of the amount of bending force in a given beam. As the load increases, the bending moment increases, and deflection in the beam increases. Beam deflection depends upon materials modulus of elasticity, or E-value. The greater the E-value, the less deflection for a given cross-section span, and load. In addition, permanent or dead loads will cause wood beams to continue to deflect over time. This phenomenon, known as creep, will result in an ultimate dead load deflection that is about 50% more than the initial dead load deflection. This may be an important consideration, especially if the dead loads are large or the application is particularly sensitive to deflection, such as a long span garage door header. While building code deflection limits are the same for all materials and spans, APA and many of its member companies recommend more stringent deflection limits for eye joist floor framing. Floor joists in general are more susceptible than heavier beams to vibration caused and felt by occupants, and eye joists in particular can span further than conventional floor joists. More stringent deflection limits help to ensure acceptable performance over longer floor joist spans. Building codes limit deflection in order to reduce floor vibration, increase in occupant comfort, and to prevent cracking of more brittle finished materials such as tile, plaster, and drywall. The codes do not differentiate by product type. The table shown here gives typical deflection limits for floor and roof members. The floor and roof member deflection limits are specified in the building codes. The L over 480 limitation for iJoyce floor members has been adopted by the industry to provide better deflection performance for the longer spans 
made possible by iJoyce Floor Systems. iJoyce Floors are designed to a higher level of performance to ensure occupant satisfaction. In this case, we are depicting a horizontal member, like a beam or joist, as the thick black line spanning the distance, L representing the length between two joists. The load in this case is depicted by the green arrows and is assumed to be uniform load, meaning that the load does not vary from one end to the other. For uniformly loaded beams, the maximum deflection occurs at the mid-span. The graph in purple gives a graphical representation of the deflection at any point along the length of the beam. Mathematical equations can be used to calculate the deflection of a beam with known material properties such as stiffness. Geometric properties, like the cross-section of a beam, also in influence deflection. In construction, the building code normally limits live load deflection to a maximum this, of the span in inches divided by 360. The symbol delta is often, often used to represent deflection. Similarly, this paragraph shows the bending force or moment along the span of the beam with the amount of bending represented by the line over the orange shape. Like with deflection, this beam experiences the maximum bending moment at the mid-span when loaded uniformly across the top. The bending moment can be calculated using the equation displayed on your screen. Another factor that must be considered in beam or joist design is the shear stress. Shear often controls the strength of a beam with a short span. As the graph in yellow illustrates, the shear stress is a maximum at the supports and reduces to zero at the mid-span of a uniformly loaded beam. Shear stress in a beam can be visualized as the sliding action of the pages within this sticky pad. Three lines are drawn on the edge of the pad and the lines are perpendicular to the top and bottom surface of the pad prior to loading. After loading, the pages of the pad must slide by the adjacent pages. The most sliding takes place near the ends of the span where the most deformation between the page occurs. At the mid-span, pages have remained in the original stack with no sliding between pages. The shear is zero at mid-span and a maximum at the supports. In this slide, all three beam characteristics under a given load are graphed with the maximum bending and deflection at the mid-span, and shear being maxed at the supports. We'll see later how this affects the performance of various beams and placement of holes that are sometimes needed for routing of plumbing or mechanical conduit. Engineered wood places the strength of the wood fiber where it is needed to resist these designs design loads. The eye joist is a more efficient use of wood since the shape places more wood in the top and bottom of the joist where higher bending stresses are present. In a simple span beam, the top flange will be loaded in compression and the bottom flange is in tension. Shear stresses are carried within the web of the eye joist, better utilizing our wood resource while maximizing performance and reducing the weight of the structural member. This section of our tr training is concerned with the design criteria. This is where we get specific about the loads and the structural capacities of our beams, joists, and columns. The duration of a given load is important since the shorter the duration, the more load can be carried by the wood structure. Loads are divided into these categories to account for the load duration in calculating strength of wood beams and joists. Most vertical loads are gravity loads. Gravity loads include permanent loads like the weight of the structure and finishes. Short-term live and snow loads are also gravity loads. Sometimes wind can impose a vertical load such as uplift on a flat roof. All of these vertical loads need to be accounted for in a building design. Some of the more extreme loads come in the form of lateral loads. Full lateral design loads are 
only experienced on rare occasions and are usually due to wind or seismic forces. The load path in this case is lateral, as shown by the red arrow. These loads are normally carried by the building's skin through shear walls or wall bracing and the roof and floor plates, referred to as roof and floor diaphragms. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, also known as FEMA, developed these charts for wind and seismic zones in the United States. You can see that the majority of the country is either in a high wind or a high seismic area, and therefore consideration must be given not only to vertical gravity loads, but also lateral loads when designing a structure. The load duration factors applied to member capacity depend upon the cumulative over the length of the structure that the member is expected to be exposed to in full design load. For example, full design snow load is expected to occur for a cumulative total of two months over the life of the structure. So roof member capacity may be increased by 15% when designing for snow loads. Where there's no snow, roofs are designed for construction loads that are expected to occur for shorter periods of time that add up to seven days over the life of the structure. In this case, member capacity may be increased by 25%. We should also note here that load duration factors are typically incorporated in design software or specification literature, so the user does not have to make manual adjustments. Other adjustment factors for wood are based on moisture levels, temperature, and chemical treatments. Higher moisture content lowers the strength and stiffness of wood components. When high levels of moisture are expected, as over indoor swimming pools or in refrigerated structures, design must compensate for the expected higher moisture contents. Also, high temperatures may impact the strength of the wood. The National Design Specification for Wood Construction, or the NDS, published by the American Wood Council, lists these other adjacent, excuse me, other adjustment factors. If wood components have been chemically treated for decay or fire resistance, you should check with the firm doing the treating of the product as to whether or not the treating has impacted the strength of the wood component. Another aspect of beam design is the condition which the beam is supported. Most beams are simply supported with one support on either end. If a beam spans over three or more supports, it is a continuous beam. In the case of a continuous beam, continuity at the interior supports results in less deflection at each of the spans. Not only is there a moment peak near the mid-span of the beam, as with a simple span, but there's also a moment, pe moment peak that occurs over the intermediate support. This is referred to as a negative moment, since the curvature is opposite to the positive moment occurring during mid-span. With a beam cantilever, the greatest moment occurs at the base of the cantilever, and this is also considered a negative moment. The curvature of a beam at a given location will tell you whether it is a positive moment or a negative moment. Loads can be applied to a beam or joist, as either uniform loads or point loads. Most load span tables are based on uniform load conditions. Point loads can be converted for use in, load span ta for use in a load span table, or they can be designed using formulas or computer sizing software. Complex structures or complex load conditions can fall outside the scope of load tables and prescriptive design methods. In this case, the structural members need to be engineered. This is covered in the building codes and allows a given segment of a structure to be either engineered or prescriptively designed, depending on whether conditions meet the assumptions in the prescriptive design tables. In the case of the wall bracing needed near the corner of the building in this slide, there are no prescriptive solutions available since the walls are loaded with windows and doors. In this case, the wall bracing, or at least a drag strut, would need to be engineered. 
The next, the next section of the engineer, excuse me, the next section of the training addresses the components that make up a structure. These components are usually oriented either vertically or horizontally. Let's begin by considering how vertical loads travel through these components. The vertical load path is simply the path that a load takes as it passes through the structure on its way to the ground. Components above barren components below. Roof load travels through walls and beams to the floor where more load is picked up. Roof plus floor load then continues through more walls and beams to the foundation and the ground below, top to bottom. The vertical load begins at the roof. The horizontal components here are the address roof rafters and perhaps the ridge beam, which we can't see in the photo. The load is then transferred down to the vertical wall studs and horizontal headers. Second story walls transfer vertical load through second floor rim boards and squash blocks to the first story walls. The second floor framing also adds its load contribution at this point. All of this vertical load then travels through the first story walls to the slab or perhaps to the first floor rim boards and squash blocks and so on to the basement walls and slab. Any interruption in this load path demands special attention. What could cause an interruption in a vertical load path? How about a poorly made or located hole in an eye joist flange or web? We'll have more information on the installation and handling of eye joists and other modules, but it is critical that the flanges of eye joists never be cut or notched in any way. They are necessary in the load path to carry the bending forces to the vertical members or foundation below. The web of an eye joist transfers the shear forces to the end of the joists. The same is true for the top and bottom areas and end vocations of structural composite lumber. The cutting and notching recommendations of these products is also found in a later module. The most common lateral load is wind. The force represented by F in the equation are distributed onto the building through both positive and negative pressures as the wind travels around the building surface. These pressures represented P in the equation are integrated over the entire represented A in the equation area that is resisting the wind pressure of the building. The lateral load path is a bit harder to visualize. Now, if we can turn the house onto its side and hang it off a cliff, we get a much better vis visualization of what it takes to resist lateral loads. How do we know for sure that the structure will stay together and not rack out of shape or roll over if it has partial resistance in the foundation? When educating professionals, on wood construction, we find the subject of loads can be confusing. The lateral load on a building in an earthquake is the result of ground acceleration represented by A in the equation. As the ground accelerates, the foundation moves along with it. The remainder of the building is left to catch up with the foundation. It is this acceleration of the building that causes the lateral force. Since the lateral force is directly proportional to the mass of the building, represented by M in the equation, lightweight wood frame structures are better suited than most massive structures like concrete or masonry to withstand earthquake forces, represented by F in the equation. So in short, when looking at lateral loads, we talk about wall, floor, and roof systems that are made up of the same horizontal and vertical members that transfer our gravity loads. Keep in mind that our loads are transferred through the structure and into the ground. Shear walls are also critical design elements that resist lateral loads. Both gravity load and lateral load forces as well as uplift need to be accounted for when designing structures. Another group of important elements in transferring all load are the connectors that attach various members to each other within a system. 
as seen here with joist hangers connecting floor joists to a beam. Here, we're looking at systems that connect roof framing to the shear walls. Note here that the lightweight metal connectors are transferring both lateral shear loads and uplift loads from the roof to the walls. It is important to understand that the most common connection devices in wood framing are nails and staples. So don't overlook common fasteners as a key link in the load path through the structure. The next section of this module addresses the components that make up a structure and how to specify products for each component. For gravity loads, these components are usually either horizontally or vor vertically oriented. For laterally oriented loads, the load carrying system also includes horizontal and vertical components. Let's begin with looking at the gravity loads that we're most familiar with. Here we see eye joists used in a simple or single span. This means that joists are supported only at the two ends without any additional support between the ends. A inch and three quarter bearing length is required at each end of the joist unless otherwise specified by the designer. Much of the information you need when specifying engineered wood products is in the trademark stamp, like other engineered wood products. Eye joists are stamped when they're manufactured with a trademark that contains critical information. The two most important pieces of information on an eye joist grade stamp are probably the depth of the eye joist and the series of eye joists. Check APA and iJoyce manufacturers' published span rating tables for iJoyce. We'll talk about tabulated spans and specifying iJoyce more in the next few slides. The trade stamp also identifies the standard the iJoyce conforms to. iJoyce are manufactured to comply to ASTM D5055 APA performance rated iJoyce, like the one in this slide, are manufactured to comply with APA standard PRI 400, which is a subset of ASTM D5055. This is an example of a span table for iJoist using simple spans from Table 1 in APA's iJoist Product Guide Z725. Most iJoist manufacturers provide similar tables for their products. Here, we're only looking at iJoist with a depth of 11 7 8 but other depth eye joists are also available, and we'll have spans based on their individual design characteristics. Here we see that 11 7 8 PRI 60 joists can span between 17 foot 10 and 22 foot 2, depending on the on-center spacing of the eye joist. Obviously, the further apart the joists are placed, the shorter the distance they will be able to span. Take a look at the footnotes. The span's lengths are based on 10 pounds per square foot dead loads and 40 pounds per square foot live loads, with the live load deflection limited to the span in inches divided by 480. This table is based on L over 480 deflection criteria, which exceeds the code required deflection criteria of L over 360. These spans are also based on the floor sheathing to be mechanically fastened to the joists, as well as glued to create what's called a composite floor. This composite assembly extends the spans beyond what could be reached if the floor sheathing was only mechanically fastened to the joists. It also helps prevent floor squeaks. As stated earlier, a minimum bearing length is inch and three quarter Bearing and web stiffeners, which we'll learn more about in the next module, are generally not required with these span limitations unless other loading is being placed on the joists. In this example, eye joists are supported at both ends and by a bearing wall located between the end supports. This span condition is called a multiple span or a continuous span. When eye joists are placed in a continuous span condition, the maximum span is different from the span, same eye joist in a simple span condition. A minimum bearing length of 3.5 inches is required for joists at 
intermediate supports. This is another span table for iJoyce from Table 1 in APA's iJoyce Product Guide, Z725. This table is for floor joists in a multiple span condition. Again, here we're only looking at iJoyce with a depth of 11 7 eighths. We see this time that the 11 7 eighths PRI 60 can span between 19 foot 5 and 24 foot 2 inches. The same joist in a single span could only span between 17 foot 10 and 22 foot 2. So we see an increase in span by nearly 10%. This difference will vary depending on the speci specific joists and the loading of these joists. Once again, the further apart the joists are spaced, the shorter the distance they will be able to span. There will be times when dealing with large houses or commercial projects, like the ones in these photos, where the basic span tables cannot be used because of heavier loads, concentrated loads, or other factors. At that point, you'll need to refer to, to design software or consult a professional engineer. Each component manufacturer provides engineers with the design properties of their products so that each component can be sized according to the loads that they carry, whether the components are I-joist, LVL, room board, laminated strand lumber, or oriented strand lumber. Each product type having its own set of design properties. These design values are also provided in a way for engineers to identify the product grade that needs to be used in a given application. Structural composite lumber, also known as SCL, which includes laminated veneer lumber, LVL, oriented strand lumber, OSL, and laminated strand lumber, LSL can be used in applications other than simple beams and headers. Designers will be required to use the manufacturer's published design properties to identify the correct size and grade of product. Light gauge metal connectors are available for all iJoyce and LVL sizes and loads. In general, the iJoyce connectors, whether they are face mount or top mount, will be one connector that is made for the maximum permissible joist loading. With LVL beam hangers, there will be several options available for a given beam size that carry different maximum loads based on the thickness of the hanger material and or the number of fasteners used. It's important that the correct hanger size, nail size, and quantity be used in this connection and that those fasteners are able to penetrate the required depth in the supporting member. That information will be provided by the manufacturer of the hangers. We'll cover some more installation tips for connections in future modules. In the next few slides, we'll look at the information we need to correctly specify engineer wood products. For SCL products, specify the size, grade, trademark or trade name, and type. Add other specifics as desired. When specifying any engineer wood product, it may be necessary to consult APA or manufacturer's documentation for capacity information. For iJoyce products, specify the depth, trademark, or trade name, and series. Add other specifics as desired. Similarly, with Brimboard, specify the product thickness, the depth, the manufacturer trademark or trade name, or APA EWS trademark grade. And then any additional information such as the member lengths and quantities. This concludes our presentation on loads, load pass, and specifying engineering wood products. Before we sign off, I'll review the training objectives and then review some APA resources you may find useful. So we've talked about the types of loads on building components. We went over designing for load paths. We looked at deflection and calculated spans of iJoyce. Kind of talked about the comparisons between simple and multiple spans. And we wrapped up by specifying engineered wood products. 
both the 2012 and 2015 versions of the International Residential Code, or IRC, include fire protective membrane requirements to enhance the fire performance of residential floor systems. APA has a wealth of information about designing iJoyce floor systems to meet the IRC requirements, including a recorded webinar we can watch online as well as downloadable publications and CAD details. If you have questions about iJoyce and fire protection, visit apawood.org iJoyce Fire Assemblies, where these resources are available for free online. APA has a lot of resources available for you as well. We all need help from time to time. APA's Product Support Help Desk is a great source for answering your engineered wood product questions. The Help Desk is a free service, and they're available to answer your questions pertaining to specification and application of engineered wood products. It is staffed by specialists who have the knowledge to address a diverse range of inquiries related to engineered wood. This is not only a fantastic resource for you, but also your customers, builders, designers, and code officials. The APA Field Services team consists of full-time engineered wood specialists located throughout North America. These engineer wood professionals include engineers, architects, and construction experts who are available to provide information and recommendations to construction and design professionals. We recommend that you get to know your APA engineer wood specialist in your area. The APA website holds a wealth of information about products and their recommended installation requirements, and all electronic downloads are free. Take a few minutes to explore the site so you're familiar with the resources that are available. Also, on the APA website is the list of all APA members, including complete lists of manufacturing facilities and their sales contacts. APA is a large selection of literature, some which will be referenced during these training modules. All of these documents are available for free download from the APA website. And finally, from the APACAD.org website, designers can download many different details. This ends today's program.